What will be the long-lasting effect to the verdict against Jennifer Crumbly, found guilty of involuntary manslaughter in her son's school shooting, Ethan Crumbly, of course, taking the life of four of his classmates at Oxford High School back in 2021. Joining me to discuss, retired FBI Special Agent Jennifer Coffendapper. A lot of talk on this one of this will have long-lasting effects. I mean, this is not at the Supreme Court level or anything like that yet. There's still yet to be appeal and such. And we have had parents get charged before. This is not honestly the first time it's happened. We go back all the way to actually 2001. Uh, there was a case where uh, a parent got charged for being neglectful, uh, having their weapon out there with involuntary manslaughter. Do you think this one's going to move the needle? I think it does move the needle. I will say you're right, though. There have been other cases. There was another case earlier this year uh, where the six-year-old actually shot the teacher, and it wasn't exactly, it wasn't involuntary manslaughter, nothing that significant, but still you can see that the courts and that the prosecutors are definitely moving toward making parents responsible when they provide guns to their young children, and then they go in and to a school and kill people. So how how does this be effective? Because here's where my mind is at. The parents who are already responsible and not providing guns to their mentally ill children are already not providing guns to their mentally ill children. Does this put enough fire underneath someone to go, hmm, maybe I should take that gun away that I gave my mentally ill child or my child in general, uh, or, or, or maybe not even decide to go to the store and go shopping because it's something they're really into, but you know it's probably a bad idea, or does it even register? that it's a bad idea to some of these people. Will this will this make a difference with those folks? Because that seems to be where a lot of these problems are coming from. I honestly don't think it's going to make much of an impact because as we've talked about it before with jury pools, right? That so many people, unless you're a true crimer or unless you're a, a newsie, you don't even know this has happened or mm -hmm. in the news. You're doing your life, you're, you know, you're working, you're trying to support yeah. your family. And so many people won't even know about this decision. But where it could be impactful, I think, is if this happens again now, again, you're right, we haven't gone up to the Supreme Court level or anything, any of the appeals. We don't know how far it will, will be appealed. But now there's a very strong precedent, I think, that has been set. And I, I just wonder how how much that will will make a difference in terms of parents. Are, are we are we going down the right road? I mean, on this one, I'm just playing devil's advocate here because you know this is one of those times where we we didn't necessarily make the gun the villain here. Uh, we, we're looking at that the parent being part of the villain here of of being uh, irresponsible of of providing uh, the the weapon to the child, but the the parent is the one with the focus. <laughs> Are we still, is this another one of these where it's like, okay, you know, we can, it's another speed bump that we can try and put in here, but we're still completely ignoring the actual issue being mental health, being the fact that, okay, we're going to implement this stuff, but then what sort of tools do we give the parents that, that could actually use it, that, that, that could help them realize right and wrong, what's safe, what's not safe, because it's one thing to make this, you know, some sort of precedent. Or, or make uh, this some sort of a legal standing going forward. But again, if you have a, a, a general public that has no idea this even happened or really understands or has the resources to prevent these sort of things from happening, what do you do? I mean, obviously, buying a gun for a kid is not a great idea when they're mentally ill. But uh, I, again, I don't think there's a lot of parents that necessarily uh, have the light bulb going off saying this is a bad idea. <laughs> well, exactly right. And that was the case here. You know, I always said, yes, was she negligent? Yes, did I believe she would be found guilty? But I also said, I don't, I don't think she really understood the breadth of his capability in terms of committing homicide. Mm -hmm. I really still don't think that she really understood it. But she didn't understand it because she was so neglectful, right? Mm -hmm. She was too busy doing her other, uh, you know, other things to really have the light bulb on. And, you know, to read his readings where he says, you know, basically my parents won't help me. Yeah. You know, I'm asking for help and I'm not getting any help. So to your point about mental illness and parents really being armed with what they need to help these children, it just doesn't seem to be happening. 
Um, and, and a lot of it comes down to money and expense, you know, not having that money or expense. But I'm going to take it one, bit, one step further, Tony. I think this case should be a wake-up call, as we're seeing over and over again, to kids that bully children. This didn't really come out as much there, but we know he was very alone. He had one mm -hmm. friend and a dog that he could relate to. Both of those were, you know, taken off of his plate that kind of propelled him into these actions. But I guess my point is America needs to wake up to the root cause of some of these shootings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point to make. I mean, it, it's it's a, it's a difficult one, too, because we're talking about kids, but we are talking about environments that that perpetrate, uh, you know, really, really going after people who already have some mental illnesses, uh, including anxiety, including depression, and, and really finding ways of pulling those people down even further. Now, a lot of us, you know, went through childhood. We get this. It was cruel. It was horrible. But they're in a totally different environment today dealing with these sort of things, which almost magnifies it a hundred times worse than a lot of the, the world that we lived in. It was you could get out of that class when we were kids and you weren't by these people. Now you get tortured 24-7 online uh, if some group of people or some group of kids so much wants to do it and the parents are completely ambivalent or just clueless as to the fact that their, their children are bullying other people. That is a, a huge thing that, again, we also seem to, to kind of look over here and like, well, kids will be kids. They will, but they can certainly be better. Yeah, I, and I agree with you. The magnification has occurred because of social media and cell phones. You just, you, these kids are not left alone when it occurs and they're made fun. I mean, we see it on Twitter, mm -hmm. X, right? Just yeah. Adults doing it to oh, one yeah. another. And in it's it's even worse, I think, certainly in the teenage realm. But I'm not trying to, you know, I'm not trying to blame any possible bullying for his no. actions. There's no excuse for his actions. But while you provide no excuse, we can look at explanations. Yeah. How did this kid, a 15-year-old, get to the place that he wanted to kill all these people? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think... That has to be explored, and I think parents are going to continue to be held responsible when they provide guns. And for those of us, you know, I have a lot of weapons mm -hmm. because I teach firearms, sure, sure. and I'm former law enforcement. So I have a house full of firearms. Mm -hmm. I say a house full. I have a safe full of firearms in my house. So, and I took my children out very young. Mm -hmm. I mean, my oldest son went out with the SWAT team, mm -hmm. you know, and shot and learned all that because I felt... In, in, in my situation, if you are going to have a gun in your house, your kids better understand what it can do, how to work it safely, how to safe keep it, mm -hmm. you know, safe management of that weapon. And and so, it, in other words, they did take him to a shooting range. Mm -hmm. They did try to teach him, I guess, that if he was going to have a gun, how it should be. And I think parents, many parents do this, Tony. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, yeah. not just the crumblies. I think you know, millions of households give their parents, give their kids uh, guns to go hunting with, mm -hmm. uh, even shoot, you know, gun pistols. Sure. And so, I mean, many of them are probably up in arms about this, no pun intended, about this decision. Yeah. But at the end of the day, the gun cannot be, uh, a, a, your child cannot get to your gun, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. In fact, the rule is, my husband shouldn't be able to get to my gun. It's not his gun. It's my gun. Yeah. And I'm solely responsible for the safeguarding of my weapons. And, and it seems like, you know, if we just followed that, a lot of the other issues would be not even there. Because if, if we, we really, truly honored that, that law, that rule of, okay, you know, we're, if you're, gonna, you're coming from a responsible place, you're, you're teaching your kids responsibly, that's the thing. Uh, but the problem is we have unhealthy parents that have unhealthy kids and have unhealthy mm -hmm. beliefs and unhealthy behaviors in terms of responsibility. And then that's how we get into these situations. If everybody just did what you just said of this is mine, I have to protect it. I have to keep it locked away. We wouldn't have uh, the, these sort of issues. I, I'm just wondering if this will be enough to uh, to push uh, maybe just even a few more parents in that direction. Hopefully it does that. I know it's not going to be world changing, but if it can slow down a little things, I think uh, there's there's a lot of speed bumps on this issue that we need to put there 
rather than just, you know, here's a big bomb that's going to change everything. Uh, there's a lot of things that can slow down these problems we have. Totally agree, Tony. Hey, it's Tony Bruschi. If you like the podcast, be sure to like, subscribe, and press that bell so you don't miss any of our updates on the cases we're following for you right here at the Hidden Killers podcast and True Crime Today. And thanks.